Welcome to Columbia University's Graduate Real Estate Development Conference in 2021. The conference theme is Stop, Go, Pivot. And I'm sure we have all experienced that. It's sequence, the reach just ring of the th sequence and so on throughout our prior year. Today, we're going to start with a fabulous panel about the macro overview. Where are we today? How will the US economy recover? And the presidential election inform the strategy, sector positioning, development trends, and investment theses throughout the next cycle. I'm the moderator, Patrice Derrington. I'm the director of the real estate program at Columbia University and the Mark Holiday Professor of Real Estate. I have two panelists. Uh, we have Joe Zeidel, uh, Managing Director and Chief Investment Strategist of Private Wealth Solutions Group at Blackstone. And we have Dr. Richard Barkham, the Executive Director and Global Chief Economist at CBRE. Welcome gentlemen, and thanks for joining us. Well, let's get started with uh, looking at the economy overall. Uh, Joe, uh, you and Byron publish every year your 10 surprises for the upcoming year. This year for 2021, uh, which you just recently issued, you say the economy develops momentum on its own because of pent up demand and depressed hospitality and airlines become strong performers. Fiscal and monetary policy remains historically accommodative Nominal economic growth for the full year exceeds 6% and the unemployment rate falls to 5%. We begin the largest economic cycle in history, surpassing the cycle that lasted from 2010 to 2020. That is a firepowered economy that may indeed be sparked by some very recent actions, such as the stimulus and economic readings, such as we're seeing in rising oil prices, etc. Are there some things in particular that you find to have very interesting and significant potential in achieving this surprise? Well, yes, and Patrice, first I'd like to thank you for having me as a part of today's panel discussion. I'm looking forward to um, a really robust discussion over the course of the next few minutes. So the first point I'd make here on, on our view, uh, my partner Byron Wien and I published the annual list of 10 surprises on Monday, January 4th. It was the 36th annual edition of the 10 surprises. And, and what we wanted to reflect at that time uh, with the, the surprise you mentioned was a more optimistic view or more bullish view of the upcoming recovery. Uh, so we wanted to really plant a flag in the ground and be ahead of consensus with respect to our growth estimates, as well as uh, unemployment uh, as well. And, and we really were of the view and still are of the view that the record stimulus would uh, end up filtering back into the economy and end up creating a, a self-sustaining recovery or a virtuous cycle. And so what I would highlight here uh, quickly is just that, you know, if you look at the damage done economically as a result of COVID, we had about a $2 trillion drop in production here in the United States. And, and so far there's been about $5.3 trillion in fiscal stimulus uh, and there is potentially more coming. Now there's the discussion of an infrastructure bill sometime later in 2021. Um, so this fiscal stimulus that's been passed and uh, is in the process of being dispersed currently is the largest fiscal policy response we've ever seen to a recession since the New Deal era. Uh, so, so far we're at about fiscal stimulus of about 23% of GDP and potentially going higher. Uh, and, and that is something that's second only to what we saw in the New Deal, which was about 40% of GDP at the time. Now, interestingly, if you look at our policy response relative to other developed countries, we've done more since December than all of Europe and Japan have done combined since the beginning of COVID. So our policy response here has really been historic. For every $1 lost in income, there's been $11 in government transfers and benefits. So what we want to really, um, the, the way that we're, we're uh, positioning our views is that this is going to be a, a highly synchronized start to the recovery. And as a result, 
we think it will form the foundation for what will be a very long cycle. And by highly synchronized, I mean, it's not just households. I think everybody here on the Zoom will, is aware of uh, households in the United States having record uh, savings, record net worth, uh, record personal income. Um, but when I talk about it being a highly synchronized recovery, it's because it's not just households. If you look at corporations, they raised record amounts of precautionary cash in 2020. And as a result, cash as a percentage of assets at corporations is the highest level it's been since the 1960s. And then thirdly, state and local governments are forecasted to produce their first surpluses since 1978. So normally these three cohorts, um, households, corporations, and state and local governments would have a more staggered start to a recovery, right? Because you have to rebuild income, then rebuild savings, then pay down debt, et cetera. But in this recovery, it's very highly synchronized in that you've got basically record cash at the household level, record cash at the corporate level, and now surpluses at the state and local government level. So that's going to introduce what I think will be a very strong front-loaded recovery. Now, the part on it being self-sustaining, and I'll, I'll just finish with this point, is when the economy was relatively closed due to COVID, when we were restricted on movement, you saw a big boom in uh, the purchase of goods. The goods side of the economy is significantly smaller than the services side of the economy. So what we saw through most of 2020, and we're still seeing it today, is a boom in the goods side of the economy. Now, when you're spending on goods, generally that money ends up being exported, right? Because perhaps you're buying, you know, uh, computers, lap, uh, laptops, iPhones, iPads, washers, dryers, et cetera. That money generally goes to low cost uh, uh, manufacturers around the world. But as we reopen the services side of the economy, it introduces what I would consider to be more of a virtuous cycle because in services, one person's spending is another person's income. So as the economy reopens in the second half and you've got all this uh, cash and the, the idea of the pent up demand, as it goes into services, it ends up creating a, a, a self-sustaining recovery in that um, you know, we will end up, uh, I think, driving a lot more uh, or recycle the money in ways that we haven't been necessarily up until this point. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, very, very exciting. And uh, definitely uh, uh, we've got some constructive uh, times ahead uh, with all of this capital. Uh, and also this notion that the service sector is a very local, local, local uh, economic dynamic, uh, which reminds us, Richard, and it's a wonderful segue for you, uh, real estate uh, is often regarded as uh, being locally constrained or locally benefic beneficial. Uh, now you've commented that you see record household cash and excess savings uh, in the, the economy also, and that you see this as a major source of, of pent up demand for consumer spending. Uh, just, you know, as Joe was saying, and that division between goods and services and so on is going to be uh, critical. Uh, what specific areas of the economy do you expect to boost consumption and particularly maybe the consequences for real estate, given the audience we have today? Well, if I could start with just a few comments on, on what Joe has said and what you reiterated, I think um, that is our house view that the US is going to see a very strong rebound in, in uh, 2021, 7% GDP growth. And indeed, some of that growth will continue into uh, 2022, um, maybe 4 or 5% growth. I don't, uh, and, and we're reasonably bullish as well, uh, you know, because you've got the stimulus and you've got consumers with a lot of cash. I don't, I would just, a note of caution, I don't think we can quite write the virus off yet. Um, and we're watching very closely the new variant of the vaccine, uh, of the virus. Um, and that is uh, a lot more infectious uh, than the old, uh, the old virus, uh, if, if you like. So it's now dominant in Europe and it's what's really caused the surge in cases in Europe. And I would be a little bit worried that uh, places like Texas and Mississippi may have opened up a, a little bit too soon. Um, and I think there's still a, uh, you know, a, a, you've got the, the, the vaccine rollout, which is proceeding extremely nicely in the States. So it's doing a great job of it, you know, two, two and a half million people being vaccinated uh, every day. But I do want to just, you know, draw people's attention to the new variant, uh, which is highly infectious. Infectious and the 
the rates of new infection um, have been dropping recently, but seem to have leveled out now. So uh, that's just, a, just an ongoing threat that we've got there. Um, but I think, you know, and then there's the question that uh, Joe raised about whether this initiates another 10 year cycle. Um, I don't think the, the, uh, the virus was really signaled an end to the old cycle. It's more of an external shock. You know, this, this kind of big shock didn't have uh, many of the, the self-destruct characteristics of an end of cycle. And uh, what that means is some of the imbalances that pre-existed continue. So whether that can sustain a, a, another 10 year cycle, I would be a bit cautious on as well, but certainly a good growth year in, in 2021 and 2022, fingers crossed on the virus. What does that mean for real estate? Well, I mean, I think, you know, Joe uh, referred to the services economy um, and we're already seeing it in, the, in the, the states that have opened up, Texas and Mississippi, huge increase in uh, eating out. So, um, you know, that kind of uh, food and beverage industry really hard hit by COVID. Um, that's going to come back really strongly, really quickly. People are stir crazy sitting at home. Um, and of course, that draws, you know, draws footfall into other areas of real estate. So, um, you know, I would see probably um, some upside, some surprising upside in physical retail. Um, people have been sitting at home buying goods on the Internet. Um, but I, I do see uh, a revival in physical retail, probably led by food and beverage and, and just a kind of post pandemic surge in wanting to get out and do things. Um, you're also seeing travel increase as well. So, you know, airline travel is going up. But one of the areas of the hotel, you know, the hotel industry was the kind of domestic leisure that held up quite well. I mean, I don't say high held up quite well, but did better than expected last year. So I see some of the demand coming through into the hotel sector as well. Um, uh, so, you know, those are you know, two areas that are going to be growth driven. The return to offices, I think, is really around the vaccine rollout. Um, and we're expecting offices, you know, they're still at relatively low level of occupancy, maybe sort of, you know, somewhere between 10 and, and 20 percent. Um, but we would see that that would that would start to, you know, that that will follow the rate of vaccination, which, um, you know, we you know, we could be up to 90 percent vaccination um, by Q3. Uh, so I think from middle of the second quarter, we will begin to see people returning to the office. And already we're seeing a little bit of a turn in sentiment uh, in office leasing. Thank you. Uh, well, Joe, I'm sure you'd like to say a little bit about how you feel about the end of the prior cycle and, and whether we've adjusted for it. Thank you, Patrice. Sorry about that. I was having a problem unmuting. Um, you know, I think Richard makes a, a, a great point about the, the external shock. Um, and so I think there is a, a bit of an open question as to whether we're starting a new cycle here or if it really is an extension of, of an old cycle. Um, one of the things that I spend a lot of time focusing on is the slope of the yield curve. And, you know, what I would note is pre-COVID, yield curves around the world had inverted. And they had inverted, uh, and, and principally when I look at the yield curve, I look at the difference between the 10-year and the two-year. And historically, the yield curve in the United States has been the most accurate predictor of recessions. Historically, when the yield curve is inverted, um, since the 1970s, you've had basically seven inversions followed by seven recessions. Um, the yield curve had inverted last uh, August of 2019 on a pre-COVID basis. Now, the curve will never tell you what's wrong. It just tells you that something is wrong. And at the time, there were many imbalances, as Richard talks about. Uh, I think a lot of them do continue today. Um, and I think a lot of the damage at the time was due to trade and trade wars. So whether or not that's really been corrected or not, I think is an open question. But the reason for my optimism here on the start of this new cycle is because what we have done is we've rebuilt savings, we've increased income, uh, we've reduced debt, 
and uh, and rates have gone even lower. Now I think we've seen a floor on on rates, so I do expect the curve to uh, uh, steepen even even further from here. Um, but generally, you know, as we're exiting COVID, we're exiting it uh, on some of the strongest footing that we've ever seen among both households, corporations, as I mentioned before, state and local governments. Now, the reason, the idea behind a long cycle is if you think about the demographics here in the United States, as an aging population, we've generally traded strong recoveries for long recoveries. If you look at all recessions going back to the 1880s, I don't think it's a coincidence that three out of the four longest expansions have been in the last 30 years. You know, generally in the second half of the 20th century, you know, from post-World War II period to, to, you know, maybe, you know, so 1945 to the year 2000, those periods between recessions, those expansions would generally see about four and a half percent GDP growth. But as the US economy aged, right, as, as boomers began to turn 65 and retire, we've generally been in a slower growth environment, but it's also translated to longer cycles. That's one of the reasons why we're optimistic that we are entering another one of these long cycles. Uh, we're gonna see uh, a front loaded recovery as, uh, as I'd mentioned. Um, and I, I do very much agree with, uh, with Richard on his assessment for the uh, above trend growth this year as well as next year. But my view is that we will settle into what will be a, a longer, but generally lower growth cycle. Uh, it's just, in my opinion, it's just a matter of demographics. Uh, you know, in our work, we'll, we like to say that demographics end up being destiny. Uh, and so what we know of aging populations is they tend to trade longer recoveries uh, for strong ones. And uh, the rising, you know, we are starting to see, as you say, slightly rising interest rates, but that's off incredibly aberrant historical levels. Um, do you, there's obviously going to be some benefits and given the demographics, as you say, we've got a lot of pensioners who rely on higher savings rates and higher interest rates on cash accounts. So do you see some benefit even if we do see some, uh, you know, higher long rates and steeper yield curves? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, I think the steeper curve reflects um, a, a healthier you know, call it more normal or self-sustaining cycle. So, so I'm encouraged by the steepening of the curve. If you look at you know, the last three recoveries, the average uh, steepness uh, in the curve is achieved in the first two years. So if you look at the last three recoveries after the 1990s uh, recession, then the tech boom, then the great financial crisis, in the first two years of the recovery, the curve starts to steepen. It peaks at an average of about 250 basis points steep. Um, that's obviously going to lead to some type of rotation, in my opinion. Uh, I think we're going to see a rotation from long duration assets to shorter duration assets. And I think we'll see that across the board, not just in fixed income. Uh, we're seeing it in equities today, where you do see the 10-year treasury yield rise and you see, quote unquote, longer duration equities underperforming. You can think about long duration equities as speculative pre-revenue companies, non-earning companies, and, and zombie companies. These are companies where their cash flow is disproportionately uh, weighted to the distant future. Uh, and so in, when we see the 10 year treasury yield rise, uh, those long duration equities that tend to have a longer payoff are, are underperforming. Now, the reason for optimism is a steeper curve brings banks back into the equation in a really positive way because it means they can earn net interest margin spread. And that's not only here in the United States, but the spillover has been global. Uh, the rate spillover has been global. So we're seeing higher yields in, in Europe uh, as well. And so if you look at things like European banks, from the time when the 10-year treasury yield bottomed on August 2nd of 2020 at around 50 basis points, you've seen European banks up about 45% through uh, the middle part of March. Now, in the entire last cycle, Right, which was March of 09 to February of 2020, the same European bank index in Euro terms was approximately flat. It was negative on a price return, but when you add in the dividends, it was slightly positive. So you've had European banks up 44% just with the steepening of the 10 year treasury. So I think it's healthy globally. So hopefully that helps. Mm. Thank you very much, absolutely. Uh, so Richard, uh, talking some of the specifics about uh, capital and capital flows and what it has meant for different countries and investment, uh, you wrote in your 2020 year end report uh, that the foreign investment in the US fell to a seven year low of 28 billion. And that's down approximately 31% from 2019 and so on. So. You, 
on the other hand, uh, you were very specific in where you felt the major fall off or the most severe fall off of foreign interest into the into uh, the US came from. And this, of course, has huge implications for such a capital heavy asset class such as real estate. Uh, so what what uh, do you anticipate these changes to continue or are we going to see different flow patterns as we move uh, out of the uh, crisis of 2020? No, I mean, all things, you know, these things tend to follow GDP. So this kind of strong growth in the United States uh, would, would tend to, I think, suck in overseas capital uh, into uh, our asset, uh, the US, I say our asset markets. I'm, I'm, I'm actually British, um, but uh, US asset markets. Um, and I think, you know, I think what we're going to see is that will be uh, facilitated, I think, by continued weakness in the dollar. So this kind of super growth in the United States uh, is going to, I think, we're going to see probably a record trade deficit um, as uh, the US continues to suck, suck in goods. Um, that uh, is it, difficult to, you know, forecasting currencies is really a mugs game and I don't really want to get into it. Um, but we've seen dollar weakness. I certainly think we wouldn't see any, there's no reason in those circumstances for dollar strength. Uh, and I think that kind of the US, you know, showing the strongest growth in the global economy, apart from China, um, you know, is going to suck in, I think, foreign capital into US real estate assets going forward. Um, and interestingly enough, even, even over the course of this crisis, um, uh, you know, because the policy support has been so intense, not just the, the fiscal policy support, but also the uh, liquidity support given by the, the Federal Reserve, um, actually cap rates in the United States have actually been surprisingly resilient. Um, we've even seen cap rate compression in the industrial and logistics sector. We've seen it in the multifamily sector. I think under conditions where the US grows ahead of the rest of the world, um, and, and, and foreign capital targets the US, you're likely to see further cap rate, you know, at the very, very least cap rate stability and probably cap rate compression. Um, there is just, I think, you know, if we survey the, the global situation um, a little bit more closely, um, China is forecast to grow at 8.2% uh, or something like that this year. It, it's quite obvious to me that the tightening cycle is, or is, is just about to begin. It's, you know, we're hardly out of the crisis and the tightening cycle likely to begin in China, I think. And China is likely to, to rein, back, rein back the stimulus. Um, so that will take a little bit of uh, heat out of the global economy and might, in a strange way that I wouldn't, you know, bore everybody by explaining, probably likely to um, you know, uh, uh, act against dollar weakness um, and perhaps not give us the, the dollar depreciation that we might otherwise have seen. Um, but, you know, I, we expect capital investment into real estate from domestic sources and international sources to be pretty robust, uh, particularly in the, the, the second, third and fourth quarter of this year. Oh, that's great. Well, capital flows are one of the key drivers of real estate uh, performance. Um, and traditionally, the other one has been uh, employment growth. Obviously, it increases the demand for offices. It increases what people can pay for multifamily residential. It, can, it increases retail. Uh, typically, you know, just one of the key leading indicators, as our uh, our students are often told, and they certainly know by the time they graduate. Uh, so, Joe, would you um, would you like to speak a little about this employment outlook? You've said that it's going to be very, very strong. Uh, we do have uh, the stimulus, uh, and uh, and we have the service sector, as you say, looking strong. Is this going to be enough to keep employment growth uh, solid? through the next few years as real estate people plan the demand and supply of their assets? I think it's a great question. I think we will see very solid labor growth. In fact, we're beginning, there, there's a risk here uh, that we're beginning to see in the, in the market. And that is we're actually starting to see tightness 
in labor markets. Uh, and specifically, what I would highlight is the uh, NFIB, National Federation of Independent Businesses, a really strong proxy for small businesses here in the United States. And they reported a record 40% of companies, 40% uh, uh, of companies, a record uh, reported that um, uh, they found uh, job openings were hard to fill. And 91% and of them in the most recent survey, which covered uh, February, uh, found few or no qualified applicants. So with an unemployment rate at around 6.2%, it sort of boggles the mind that companies are beginning to see labor tightness. Um, there, there, is, there are some explanations to it. One is uh, schools. Uh, being um, uh, modified for virtual or at-home learning. And that has had a dispor disproportionate effect on women and uh, specifically the, the uh, causing uh, women to drop out of the labor force in rates well in excess of, of, of men. Uh, in fact, if you look at the labor force participation rate, even though we have a high, un relatively high unemployment number of 6.2%, the labor force itself is uh, smaller than it was on a pre-COVID basis because so many people have been forced to drop out or have dropped out for other reasons. Um, and if you look at, at the demographics, women uh, lost 220,000 more jobs than men did last year. Some of it, a small portion of it is, um, is sort of explained by gender distributions among, uh, among industries. But a more significant driver is uh, when you look at um, mothers and the labor force participation rate for mothers is 4% below where it was on a pre-COVID basis. And so as schools reopen, we think the prospects for childcare will improve and that should bring people back into the workforce. There are simply other people who may have just decided to retire early. For instance, there's 10,000 boomers that turn 65 every day. Um, so it could very well be that we're looking at a structurally smaller labor force. Um, which could actually exert some upside pressure on, on wages. Um, so we could end up having a, a tighter labor force and one that drives wage growth. It's obviously very, very good for households, but it does run the risk of creating some longer term or, or core or stickier inflationary pressures. Thank you. Um, and so Richard, uh, another aspect of this um, strong economic activity and, and increasing strength and anticipated strength is um, improving uh, margins for particular areas of the various sectors of the real estate uh, market. And one of these that you have uh, really focused on and, and highlighted uh, in your recent commentary has of course been this industrial sector which previously we weren't quite so quickly to align it. Yes, it certainly had its correlation, but you have pointed out that this uh, industry, the growth in the industrial sector has been particularly strongly correlated with the economy this time. Uh, and you uh, have discussed the increased uh, growth, rental growth in this expanded logistics activity uh, generally because of how we're now ordering and buying and being supplied with our goods. Uh, and of course, this differs from our traditional focus on multifamily and office. So do you anticipate this continuing? Uh, is the sky the limit in terms of, you know, the new, not your grandfather's uh, industrial property sector? Yeah, I mean, I think we do. I mean, it was really surprising when we when we kicked off this whole pandemic crisis, we thought there might be a a one year, you know, uh, cycle, hit, a one year hit to the industrial sector, a two year hit to the office sector and a three year hit to the, the retail sector. Well, we've, we've telescoped those all back in a little bit. And indeed, the, the industrial sector, you know, actually didn't really break step. Um, and Q4 in 2020 was a record quarter for the level of uh, square footage net absorption. Now, I'm going to forget the precise figure, but it was about, you know, 280 million square feet. And uh, we, we continue to think that the next 24 months is going to see you know, extremely high levels of net absorption of space. And it's, you know, it's, it's driven by the things that you would expect. Um, obviously, the, the high rates of GDP growth and the the, the, the need to ship more goods to, 
to consumers is, is, is all part of that. Um, but I also think that American suppliers will want to, uh, and, and all, all of the, the, the American distribution system, probably want to hold higher stock levels uh, than they had in previous cycles. The, 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 you know, the, the, the shock of the disruption from COVID um, is still fresh in mind. So kind of higher stock levels, um, higher levels of economic growth. And you know the the growth of, of e-commerce, um, albeit you know some of that you know will slip back. I think um, post pandemic, as people go back to the the shops, as I've, I've explained. Um, but we're seeing e-commerce, you know, moving into you know out of kind of hard goods, also into um, uh, you know, uh, the distribution of grocery as well as a strong growth area. So refrigerated logistics is another area that uh, had been growing pre pre COVID, but is you know I'm going to make the, the worst joke on the planet, but refrigerated logistics is an extremely hot sector. Um, so uh, you know I think we do see that continuing for extremely strongly from the next uh, 24 months, um, and then I think you know we follow the, the scenario that that, that Joe had. Uh, had outlined that that growth will probably slip back to a um, you know unless we get some other big event or you know the the, the coming boom in the, the U.S. economy actually proves a lot bigger than we all thinking um, then I think growth will slow back to that that um, relatively low level of, of economic growth um, I think just you know uh, I'm going to you know throw in something that you didn't ask about I think. To a certain extent, uh, how the the economy grows, um, you know, from maybe 2023 20, onwards, depends a little bit about on on immigration policy, because you know we may well run into labour force constraints, and you know the, the US you know then has a choice whether it can grow the economy uh, without inflation pressures building up, or whether it can you know start to uh, it, it, uh, it, uh, you know, solve uh, some of the labour supply problems. Um, you know, by by higher levels of immigration and immigration immigration's dropped off quite considerably uh, over the last twelve months. You know, partly that is policy, partly that is COVID. But I think it is possible. You know, the long cycle theory depends to a certain extent, I think, on immigration uh, decisions. Mm. And immigration decisions, as we know, are politically fraught at the moment and will probably take a, quite a while to resolve uh, politically in, in governance and so on. Uh, and both of you, Joe, you mentioned sort of tight indications of tightening labor markets. So this is the usual uh, outbreak of inflation. Uh, and so this has led to recent um, changing predictions such as by uh, the Federal Reserve just this week estimating inflation of 2.6% for 2021, something we haven't seen for a long, long time. And then we have Larry Summers, you know, warning about warning about inflation and its undermining of, of uh, asset values. Uh, so what's your view on this potential for inflation to, to bounce back problematically? Or is it going to be manageable? Keeping in mind, let me say, that commercial real estate investors, we really view uh, real estate as offering a hedge against inflation. We have built in uh, consumer price indexes in leases and so on, and even actually benefiting from it in a not terribly rigorous analysis of appreciation, uh, a more of a nominal uh, appreciation in, in asset values but we tend to think of it as really being more beneficial than, than lacking until, of course, you get those nasty interest rates on your debt. Yeah, it's a, well, a terrific question. And, um, and I think this inflation debate is one that we're going to be having, um, you know, not only now, but I think we'll be having it for the next couple of years, uh, because I do think there is a, a risk. The way that I would, uh, I would look at it, and I'll offer maybe a couple of comments, I think we'll see a reflation now, uh, but the long-term inflationary picture, I think is a, a much different one. And I'll, I'll highlight a couple of reasons in a minute, but the reflation now I think is number one, just part of some of the historic 
uh, excess liquidity that we see, uh, not only in the part of households, but corporations, state and local governments. Uh, number two, uh, a reflection of an economy that will open up where you'll have uh, you know, the service sector, maybe not necessarily having been able to scale up to handle the, the demand. Um, and, uh, and number three, just simply the, the base effects that a lot of the low inflationary numbers from the second quarter of last year are going to begin to roll out of CPI. So there's some mechanical reasons as to why inflation will rise in the short term, uh, followed by some actual fundamental or what I would call economically based reasons. But inflation over the long term, I think, is a, a bit of an open question. And I might start off with uh, maybe just a rough paraphrase of a comment that um, Fed uh, Chair Powell made in front of Congress just a couple months ago when he said, the inflation that I grew up with as a kid is gone. Um, and you know what he's referring to there is the type of inflation that we saw in the, in the 70s up until um, uh, up until uh, it was broken in the, in the early 1980s. Um, there is uh, an argument, and, and I subscribe to this point of view, that says demographics are destiny and an aging population is inherently disinflationary. So to separate out the short term, which is going to be a reflation, which I think we'll see over the course of the next couple of years as a result of all of this excess liquidity versus the long term, which I think will be uh, you know, over the course of a, a very long cycle, I would envision that this tug of war between the short-term reflation and long-term disinflationary forces is something that's gonna play out uh, uh, on, on a real-time basis for, for all of us and it will affect asset allocation and portfolio decisions. The long-term is, is, is this. If you look around the world at the countries with the greatest proportion of people that are 65 and older, those are the same countries that have the highest proportion of zero rates and negative yielding debt. And I don't think that's a coincidence. In the United States, uh, 10,000 boomers turn 65 every single day. The first boomer uh, is a retired public school teacher living in South Jersey. Uh, if you Google her, you'll see a picture of her on her boat. The name of her boat is First Boomer. The last boomer uh, was born December 31st, 1964 at 6.45 p.m. local time in a hospital in Hawaii. Uh, he'll turn 65 in the year 2030. Between the first and last boomer, 74 million people. Now, when you think about that, in the context of what we know of Europe's demographics and Japan's, it means that across the US, Europe, and Japan, one out of four people is 65 or older. That's 200 million people across US, Europe, Japan. If you look at the countries with zero rates and negative yielding debt, it's Europe, Japan, and then of course, the US. I don't think that's a coincidence. Uh, if this were a course on economics, somebody would raise their hand and say, but wait, Milton Friedman said, Inflation is everywhere, always will be a monetary policy phenomenon. Milton Friedman argued that for the first time in June of 1970 in a publication. What I don't think Milton Friedman was maybe quite aware of in his day was the role of demographics because the data he had at his fingertips in 1970 was all pointed toward a booming generation, a booming population in US, Europe, Japan. So I think the shorter term is about the economy absorbing record liquidity. Longer term, I don't think it's a coincidence that the countries, the oldest countries in the world have the lowest rates. So I'll stop there. Oh, and you know, low inflation rates are actually more historically prevalent if you go back some centuries and so on. So maybe the higher rates was, was the aberration. Um, and Richard, I know that you know, you're constantly looking at inflation with respect to the various property types, uh, different asset values, different return metrics and so on. So would you like to comment on the anticipated impacts and nuances on the property sector, uh, on the, for the property sector for us? Well, I mean, first, just to, you know, I think, uh, you know, our general view is that, uh, you know, similar that um, despite the fact that we've got all this uh, um, fiscal stimulus, I don't, we, we do see inflation trending up over the next uh, 12 months or so. And it, it, it might just trend up a little bit higher than we expect. And it will create a lot of chatter uh, a, a, about, you know, the future. And that, I think it will create a jittery bond market. Um, you, you know, I think we do expect it to settle back down. And, and, you know, this is certainly not going back to the 1970s. And, you know, um, even now, even with all the economic stimulus we've got, it, you know, if you take the, um, the unemployed and the underemployed, even in the United States, you've got 18 million people without jobs. 
So, you know, despite these record economic stimulus uh, going in, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of labor still to be absorbed into the market. And um, we may see uh, odd sectors of the economy where, where uh, labor markets are extremely tight um, and we get some wage inflation, but that's probably not going to, to translate into a general inflation um, going forward. And this, this, you know, there is still, there are negative output gaps. Um, uh, you know, there is, there is more supply uh, than there is demand uh, in most of the G7 economies um, uh, over the next two or three years. So not much, not enough demand pressure to stoke up inflation. Um, what does all, all of that mean? But, but nevertheless, you know, um, I wouldn't want to write Milton Friedman off completely. You, you know, you've, you, you've, you, you know, the last 10 years we saw a kind of decade uh, when the money supply expanded by something like 4% per annum, and we had a decade of low inflation. You know, the money supply has just expanded by about, I don't know, 50 or 100%, uh, depending on how you, uh, how you care to kind of classify. And it's not really clear nowadays how you do classify the money supply anyway. So I wouldn't want to write that up. And that might have some effects that we can't quite see uh, at the moment. So we don't want to write that up. We want to keep, a, we want to keep our eyes open for uh, economic anomalies uh, and, and, and just keep alert to what they're telling us. Um, probably all of that monetary expansion will go into asset markets, but it might not. Um, and we can't write that off completely. Um, what does it mean for real estate? Well, I think, you know, one of, one of the attractions of real estate as an investment asset class, obviously, is its income producing potential and its, its cap rate. You know, I think uh, we would probably see bond rates. So that, I think they're, they're up at 1.7% 1. 1. today. Um, probably likely to continue to nudge ahead. Uh, my, my previous forecast was for, for the 10-year T to be at 1.8% by the end of this year. I might have to revise that up a little bit. Um, and maybe we'll see bond rates, you know, nudging meaningfully above 2% um, over the next 12 months or so, maybe even up to 2.5%. Um, and the 10-year treasury is, is really what property investors price real estate against. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, there are enough offset. So, you know, the theoretically, one might begin to think, is that going to push up cap rates? Uh, but I think there's enough spread between, you know, real estate cap rates. Real estate spreads over 10-year treasuries are actually pretty elevated. Um, and that's been one of the reasons cap rates have been so stable. That's been enough of a spread to counteract the risk that's in the, the system over the last six or nine months. Uh, I think, you know, as risk diminishes, you know, I think investors will be comfortable with seeing that spread diminish. So I don't see too much uh, upward pressure on cap rates in any sector. Um, in addition to that, you know, positive factors, you know, our, our, our econometric models, you know, also pick up impacts, positive impacts on cap rates coming through from inflation, positive impacts, i.e., compressing factors on, on cap rates coming through from rental growth, which is, you know, set, set not exactly to, to, to turn, or we've got high rates of rental growth. In, I'm talking about the office sector, probably see uh, a bottoming of rents in the next 12 months and people can look forward to some rental growth. And, you know, uh, the other thing that kind of keeps downward pressure on, on cap rates is um, just quantitative easing. You know, central bank uh, actions around the world have, have been quite significant in depressing cap rates. So, um, you know, I, I've talked a little. You know, that, that's a bit of a rambling um, kind of discussion. You asked the question, "What about inflation? Mm. Inflation and, uh, mm. and, and and real estate? Um, generally, inflation. In, you know, investors switch to real estate if they get a whiff of inflation." Mm. Um, but I don't think there's enough inflation to push bond rates out far enough mm. to, um, you know, to, to give us any you know, meaningful upward pressure on real estate cap rates. Uh, by contrast, I think the, you know, the counter, you know, there's enough spread and there's enough countervailing forces to keep cap rates stable or even see some compression over the next 12 or 24 months. 
Mm, mm, thank you. And it seems as though both of you are welcoming, uh, you know, we need some healthy inflation. So it's all a matter of quantum, of course. And uh, maybe we'll have that Goldilocks scenario for real estate, whereby we have some uh, good inflation. So we get our incomes going up, rental incomes going up and so on. And uh, that gives us enough spread over, you know, moderately rising uh, yields, debt yields. So uh, let's let's uh, focus on that outlook and, and uh, sleep at night for a while. Um, so thank you, both of you gentlemen. Now we're just going to finish up with some closing thoughts. Uh, the audience today includes many real estate professionals globally. We've got people tuning in from all over the world and uh, particularly a, a lot of students in connection with our Columbia real estate uh, a graduate real estate development program, and they're going to be either hiring, expanding their real estate businesses in this, uh, you know, coming scenario or this uh, more constructive scenario. And uh, of course, students are trying to find employment in uh, in this industry. So, do you have any specific thoughts about what you think might be the interesting areas for expansion, growth of uh, the professional activity? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll comment on that a little bit. Um, we've just released our Global Investor Intentions Survey. Um, and I think, you know, one of the interesting things is 50 odd percent of investors are deploying ESG strategies. Another 30 percent of investors intend to, uh, de you know, deploy ESG strategies. So, um, you know, I think I think you know all of the traditional areas of, of, of real estate hiring are going to be strong. So I think your your students are looking forward to quite quite a good market. But if they wanted to position themselves for the long term, they might think about how they play a role in uh, in decarbonizing the economy. Um, that has you know that's extremely important in Europe. It's it's got slightly less resonance in the, in the United States, but it's still I think. You know, uh, some people would hold the view that, that the U.S. has taken a strategic decision to green its economy. Um, so I would say, you know, both people who are investing and developing um, and even, you know, uh, on the occupier side need to look at sensible ways that they can, uh, you know, work with the built environment, the built stock to uh, to to, to uh, make a, a contribution to decarbonizing the, the economy. Mm, mm, thank you. And Joe, that real estate uh, mammoth uh, at Blackstone, uh, what's their focus these days? Well, I would really underscore Richard's comments on ESG and the long-term role that that's going to play in the real estate and in so many other industries. Uh, so I think that's a critically important area. And, you know, you might even, um, you know, you might even point to uh, China, which just released details on its 14th five-year plan. And what wasn't contained in there were specific GDP targets, but what was contained in there were specific targets for research and development, as well as targets on climate and decarbonization. Uh, so I think it's a worldwide phenomenon. I think it will shape the next uh, decade or more. So I would very much agree with Richard's comments about positioning oneself for the uh, ESG um, uh, 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 and decarbonization sort of trends. I think they are secular long-term trends. Last thing I'd mention is just the value of networking, uh, especially for the students out there. Uh, in my own history, as I look across the various different jobs that I've held in the finance uh, industry, you know, one thing that stands out is virtually every job I've ever had has been the result of knowing somebody uh, either in the field or at the specific company. Uh, and so I think networking is, is critically important uh, beyond just LinkedIn. Uh, anything that uh, folks can do out there to create personal connections, I think will end up helping them in the long term. Thank you. Thank you. That's good advice. And you'd be absolutely amazed at how our students have built up all sorts of creative forms of networking despite the COVID restrictions. So your words are well taken. Thank you, both of you, both gentlemen. It's been a fabulous way to start our conference. Um, optimism, but measured. Uh, real estate continues to be something that we should continue to love. So we like that. Uh, thank you to you both. And 
We'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.